It tastes like so many things. Um, I think that's the best part about it is that it's so flavorful. They just have so much taste that I think you're missing in a lot of food that you buy at the grocery store that's sweet or salty, that doesn't have these like delicate, complex, subtle, nutty, bitter, fruity, floral flavors. We aren't a certified organic garden, but we do practice sustainable and organic growing methods. So that really means that we use organic products if we do spray for things like pests or viruses, funguses, bacterial infections on plants. But I try to keep even the spraying with organic products down to a minimum. Other than that, we try to manage on the back end to keep healthy plants before they even get to a point of needing additional fertilizers, any sort of treatments with organic products. So that means maintaining healthy plants in the greenhouse and babying them while they're seedlings until they get established as larger plants. And then also making sure that the soil is a good pH when we plant our vegetable and fruit plants and also has enough nutrients to support the plant through its growing stages. Once you have a homegrown tomato, you will never want to buy a store-bought tomato. I can, again, I can guarantee you. It's higher nutrient quality because you, if you think about it, it's not taking as long for the produce to get from point A to point B. So you're consuming homegrown produce at the height of its freshness at the height of its nutrient content. So you're getting this really delicious produce. You don't have to be a chef to know that cooking with good ingredients is just as good as cooking with a, a good recipe. If you have the base of good vegetables and good herbs, and especially fresh herbs, and a little bit of salt and pepper it goes a really long way. And we appreciate having that fresh stuff year round, whether it's in the peak of, of season in in June, July, August, or that's something that we preserved and then tied back into a menu later in the school year. Washington Lee doesn't have an agriculture program, but it's still really important for students and staff, I think, to think about where their food is coming from. And just having the garden here, whether or not students are working in it or they're seeing the produce in the dining venues, I think it really gets students to think about the process of growing food, where it comes from, how it gets from a farm or a garden to their plates. In sustainability, we look at the three levels, so the economics, the environment, and the social issue. And the campus garden and our compost system hit all three of those things. We're saving the university a little money. We are providing a very healthy food alternative for our community, and we're protecting the environment a little bit. I think uh, when, when people see large companies, large schools, large families all making this effort, they see, oh, well, those 100 people can do it. Why can't I, as one person, do it? So I think it's responsible for us to set a good example for others to follow. More students are paying attention to this and expecting these kinds of practices as the norm. They're expecting recycling bins to be everywhere. They're expecting compost to be a, a normal thing. They're coming to us from other places and saying, well, this is, where, this is what it looked like in my home, so how can we make it look like that here? And that gives me a lot to work on and, and also makes it very meaningful because I know the campus is looking for these things or asking for these things. That's why I typed it for you. I didn't I knew you wouldn't have time. So I typed something for you. You're welcome. I'm also OCD. So I know like it makes me like No, it makes me like I'm not worried. So I just wanted to, you know, get get this to you. So how do you get this to you? You know, you just like you just you just kind of you just like I just found it interesting. So yeah, introduce yourself. Just open it up. It's all good. And then she's doing closing.
Are there folks in Overflow yet? Or because some people always opt to go to Overflow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I thought no. I often will go to Overflow for an event if I think I need to pop in and out. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this conversation between Reverend Robert Lee, Professor Ted Delaney, on reconciling our history. This event is sponsored by the Campus Coalition for Change, which I, Daniel Phillips, a third year law student, am proud to be the president of. Also, the Black Law Student Association and the Sydney Lewis Law Center. Professor Chapman, will moderate this discussion today. And in the foreword to Reverend Lee's book, Reverend Bernice King writes, like my father, some of us are called to communicate with the masses. But I believe that all of us are called to communicate with one another. Now the goal of today's event is to begin this communication by bringing together two people with very different histories with Lexington and Washington and Lee. Reverend Lee is a descendant of Robert E. Lee and best known for his activism around speaking out against white supremacy and idolatry of his ancestry. He's joining us today to discuss that activism and to, to discuss his forthcoming memoir, A Sin by Any Other Name. Professor Ted Delaney is a fourth generation resident of Lexington and a professor of history here at Washington and Lee. After working on campus for nearly two decades, primarily as a lab assistant and taking a class semester, he began attending WNL full time at the age of 40. Professor Ted Delaney graduated cum laude in 1985, received a PhD from William and Mary in 1995, then returned to Washington and Lee as faculty. Since returning to Washington and Lee as faculty, he's been an influential force serving our community in immeasurable ways. And without any further ado, I will turn this over to Professor Chapman. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. And I'd like to thank uh, Reverend Rob Lee for coming out to Lexington for only his second time ever in his life and you know, touring our campus for the first time in his life. Uh, to embark on this conversation. The goal of today is to start a dialogue that hopefully will continue, a very meaningful conversation about how we reconcile the past of Washington and Lee and move forward in the future. Uh, the way that I would like this to work is I want it to feel like we're eavesdropping on their conversation. I'm only going to pime in when I need to, to to keep the conversation moving, but my hope is that uh, you know Reverend Rob and Professor Delaney will, you know, just inform us all and teach us how to have this dialogue and possibly how to keep the dialogue continuing. So Rob, would you like to start? Yeah, well, um, thank you all so much for having me. It means so much to be here. This is my second time to Lexington. Um, and I say that because in a real sense, I've been terrified to come here. 
And that's not your fault, I promise. None of you have done anything to me. But there is a very real sense of the weight of history in this place. There is very much, for me especially, a reality that I have to face when I walk onto this campus. And I have to tell you, it happened for me today in a really profound way. Uh, uh, Stephanie was taking me on a tour uh, uh, of Lee Chapel, and I saw President Lee in his civilian garb, something I hadn't seen in a very long time. And he looked really sad. He looked really broken. And you know, it's easy for me to hate on the idolatry of General Lee, of President Lee, of the person that we've made him out to be. But I was having to remember his humanity in that moment. And that was difficult because you, you have this image of him if you're a progressive person or, or even just a person of goodwill. You, you see that he fought for the continued enslavement of black people in the Civil War. So what do you do with that? I think you do what we do now. And that's have a conversation and that's surround each other and envelop each other with love and acceptance and tolerance while also recognizing that there is a painful past that we all share. Regardless if you're from Maine or the Red Hills of Georgia whether you're from California or the Piedmont of North Carolina, we are all a part of this conversation. And it's incumbent upon all of us, whether your name is Robert Lee or whether you are a person of color, to somehow find your part, your role, your task in this conversation. One thing that strikes me about what I've read of your memoir is that this seems to be a very spiritual journey. And because it's a very spiritual journey, it seems to me that it takes a, a dimension that society doesn't really oftentimes look at. Uh, Bernice King, in her introduction to your memoir, refers to it as a letter of love to the church. And so, I'd like for you to expand on that, this whole idea that uh, this is a letter of love, this memoir, and that somehow this memoir, you also say, is a memoir with a mission, and uh, how all of that, uh, what your vision is for all of that. Well, as I said, the greatest secret uh, is that I have a book coming out next Tuesday. Um, <laughs> find it on Amazon or wherever books are sold. Um, I had the opportunity to get to know Bernice King, the daughter of the late Martin Luther King Jr. And she read my book and she said, Rob, this reminds me of my father's letter from the Birmingham jail. I had to pick myself up off the floor. But it's also a reminder that there is a very pastoral aspect to calling people towards justice. There is a very holy act of saying that the way things are now are not the way things they should be. You know, I've been, um, I had some light reading today. I was reading, a, a, I don't know the correct terminology, forgive me, Mr. President, but the commission that you, you commissioned on moving forward um, with the university. And I, I read it and I was amazed that you actually want to have a conversation. The church doesn't want to do that. You're doing a better job than the church on this because Dr. King said it best, the church is the most segregated hour that we have. In my hometown of Statesville, North Carolina, we have First Baptist Church on Davy Avenue, and we have First Baptist Church Incorporated on Garfield Street. The one on Davy Avenue, white people go to. The one on Garfield Street, people of color go to. You think Jim Crow's dead. We didn't kill Jim Crow. We just gave him a different name. 
some would call him James Crow Esquire um, in the law school. But, I, but, but, but back to your spiritual point, I think that the holy act of resistance as to the status quo of right now, the holy act of resistance to what happened in Charleston, to what happened in Charlottesville, that's the gospel work. To say that that is not who we are, that we are better than that, and that enough is enough. Well, when you talk about First Baptist Church in different uh, segments of the same small town of Statesville, it seems to me that there's a little bit more than race that characterizes those two churches, and one of those things we would see as a part of race for sure, and that being culture. So how do you reconcile two groups of people whose understanding of even the kind of worship they are doing when you think of the music, when you think about uh, the things that happen in the church socially, et cetera, how do you reconcile these two different cultures if you were to bring them together into one First Baptist Church? You know, part of me wonders if we should bring them into one First Baptist Church but we should at least be having conversation with one another as to why we aren't together occasionally, as to why we can't break bread together or share a meal with one another. You know, I'm not asking people to change the way that they have worshipped for the past 150 years, but I'm asking you to consider, as, as, as white folk especially, in the church, what does it mean to look at the way we've always done things and wonder if there is a better way. And the better way might not be bringing everybody together. That might not work. You know, it doesn't always work to sit in a circle and sing Kumbaya. But it does work to have that hard and difficult conversation, the necessary conversation of bringing people to the table. You know, and, and I talk about this in the book. Um, one, of the, one of the times that this happened most prevalently was um, I, I had a friend who passed away in a car accident in 2009, and we had the predominantly black drum line from the high school come and play outside the church, the white church. Fifty years prior to that, the pastor of First Baptist Church Incorporated on Garfield Street led a pray-in at the same exact spot where that drum line played. You see what I'm getting at is some of these things that we're trying to move are very, very slow. You need only look at this institution to see that sometimes things move slowly. You need only look at the church to look, see that sometimes things move slowly. And then there are other times where you see the change happening in real time, and that's holy. Okay. Uh, the conversation, it seems to me, has to be a lot more extensive than with the churches. Yeah. So how do we initiate that? Any ideas? So I'm going to tell you that, that it's not easy before I, let me preface this by saying it's not easy. It's going to start at your Thanksgiving tables. There are people in my family, God love them, God bless them, who think that Robert E. Lee was the greatest man who ever walked this earth since Jesus Christ himself. And they cannot stand what I'm doing. The easy thing for us to do at Thanksgiving would be to sit there with our ham and our turkey and just eat and talk about Duke winning against Carolina when we play him in the national championship. But the necessary thing to do, the tasks that we are called to do, is to sit there and go to town. Tell them this is who we are. You know, it, 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 and that's just one example for me personally, but it, it, do, it doesn't, you don't have to be a lead to, to get what I'm saying. You got people in your family, you got to get your own folk. Um, 
I've been lucky enough to have some really incredible people of color in my life, two of them sitting right here, who have helped kind of pull me in the right direction sometimes. But white people in the room, it's time for us to start getting our own folk and getting our own people and saying enough is enough. Um, and it starts there. It also seems to me that there has to be compromise. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about compromise, then you have two polar opposites and people have to be able to say, well, I'm going to give up something. And giving up whatever ends up being a very, very difficult uh, thing to do. And when I look at the fact that giving up and compromise oftentimes is across a color line, uh, then as a black person, I sometimes get very, very defensive because it seems that we've always been the ones who were expected to give up and to compromise. It, what are your thoughts about this? I mean, this is something that, at least from a spiritual point, that we have to do, is we have to be willing to give up. We have to be willing to compromise. And it seems that the tension, the real tension, is there. And how do we say that Thanksgiving dinner can become a terrible fight? And I'm not sure that fights are especially productive, but how do we compromise? How do we get to the point where we compromise? I call this strategic resistance. Is it worth it? Is it holy? Will it affect change? And if it is, if, if, if you can answer yes to those things, if what you are doing, at least from a spiritual perspective, can help affect change in such a way that you are helping people see a broader perspective, then it's worth it. But Jesus also said something about people who didn't get it. He said, dust, the, dust off your sandals and walk away to the next town if they don't want you. You know, and he also said a prophet isn't welcome in his hometown. I got people in my hometown who want me dead. But I would rather be on the right side of history. I would rather be a different footnote in history than that of my uncle. And that's important to me. That's why I'm here today. I, I don't just do this for, for giggles, you know. I don't just come out here because I, I want to make you mad. I come out here because I believe in the salvation and sanctification of the world. I believe that this stuff is what we have to do. Not just we as Washington and Lee, not just we as Lexington, Virginia, but we as the United States, we as the world, we as Christians, Muslims, Jews, Buddhists, Hindus, whatever you are, whatever you aren't. The whole of humanity is called to make this place better. And even if that means that sometimes we have to get in a fight for it, if that fight causes people to open their eyes to a new and different way of life, of the pursuit of happiness, of those basic rights that we believe are for all people, or at least we thought were for all people, then it's worth it. But you also got to think about the strategic resistance, right? Is it going to hurt you? Is it going to cause your mental health to go down the tube? Because it can, trust me. Um, you got to dust the dust off your sandals. Well, one thing that strikes me, and you certainly speak to this in your memoir, is leadership, and you call it courageous leadership. Uh, seems to me that it takes a lot of courage to do what you're doing, and how many of us have that kind of courage? How many people are willing to stick their necks out to the point where they get death threats, as you and your wife have? Uh, how do we promote that kind of courageous leadership in the world? I'm bipolar. I suffer from mental illness, so it's, 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 it's something that I deal with very regularly. Um, part of me thinks I'm crazy. But in the moments of clarity, 
in the moments when it matters, in the moments when I stood on the MTV VMA stage or at The View or um, in the pulpit that Dr. King preached from in the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church, I realized that I'm not crazy. I'm just trying to make a difference. I'm trying to be the best Robert Lee I can be. And if we can do that, if we can abandon all those doubts that we have, whether it's because we have a mental illness, whether it's because of our socioeconomic status, whether it's because of our sexual orientation, whatever it may be, whatever we need to, you know, that society has told us we are not good enough because of, when we abandon that and say to hell with it, I'm going to be this person, that's when change happens. Because we are authentically ourselves. On the first page of my book, I quote the poet Galway Kennel, one of my favorite poets. And he says, sometimes it is necessary to reteach a thing its loveliness. Sometimes it's necessary to reteach yourself your loveliness. And every time I get a death threat, I think, well, man, if this is it, I'm hanging up my hat. Then Professor Chapman calls. <laughs> and I said, well, I got to go. Because, you know, and forgive me for going back to Scripture and to the spiritual thing of it, but if you think about it, you know, I, you know Jeremiah was like, I was just a boy. Esther didn't want to do it. Jesus even said, let this cup pass from me. But then they got up and they did the work that needed to be done regardless of the situations that affected them. And that's how I get through it. That's how I get up in the morning. I mean, I put my pants on like the rest of you, but I just believe, and I hope you do too, that there's a reason for it. So have you, since you've been here today, have any of your thoughts, any of your ideas been uh, changed at all? Or With all due respect to Washington and Lee, I came here thinking I would not be, dare I say, accepted. Or I thought I'd be accepted in the wrong way. I thought I'd be the, oh my God, be Robert Lee. But I have been warmly welcomed by faculty, by students, um, by the administration, um, and that's beautiful. Because that means that you're really putting your money where your mouth is. That means you're really starting to enact what you're trying to do. Because I had my father or my grandfather come here 40, 50 years ago, my age might be a different story. I might have had a parade for him. But this is a different time. And it really, really impressed me that you all are acting, that you're acting on what you have said you will do. Well, you uh, mentioned a while ago you read the commission report this morning. It's 88 pages. It's a, you're a quick reader. It, 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 was, it was a light read. Okay. <laughs> just, just kidding. So do you remember any specifics about the commission report that you'd like to discuss or talk about? I want to actually say that, I, that I'm actually really impressed um, by one of the recommendations that you not change your name. Um, and I don't think I would have said that years ago when I first started this. Because for a while I was like, we got to tear it all down, we got to take this all down, Washington and Lee's got to go, um, you know, to hell with it all. But what I was wrong about and what I think a lot of people in progressive circles are wrong about 
is the idolatry's got to go. The worship, the, the iconography, if you will, the, how, how we portray President Lee has got to go. But then you see that this is a place that has been, for so many people like yourself, a beautiful, beautiful place. And you see it a little differently than maybe I see it because I'm a little jaded uh, simply by vocation of being that close to Robert E. Lee. But it's, it, this is a beautiful place. I agree that it's a beautiful place. And I also was a member of that commission. And, uh, and one of the things that we tried to do for a very long time is figure out whether we even had uh, a charge to speak to the name of the school uh, in our report. And if you remember that what we said is we do not recommend a change at this time. Yeah. And um, so I think the general thought on the part of the commission, and I've not really spoken publicly about uh, the commission's working before, but I think the thing that we generally thought that if there was a change of name, the recommendation should not come from the commission, but it should be a groundswell from within the community that uh, decided that the name should be changed. And we felt reluctant to make that recommendation uh, short of it being a community discussion and, a, and seeming groundswell for that kind of thing. Uh, does your resistance to the idea of the change of the name of the school uh, have anything to do with your own refusal to change your name? No. Um, I don't want to change my name because I like my name and I'm a different Robert Lee than the Lee that this, was, this university was named after. The re my reluctance to, to uh, endorse or to say that this place should be changed is in large part to, uh, uh, to a quote that, that, I, that I really admire from Dean Sam Wells, who was Dean of Duke Chapel and now he's a vicar at St. Martin's in the Fields in Trafalgar Square in London. Um, he was, uh, he, he um, said, if it can't be happy, make it beautiful. Nothing about what Robert E. Lee did during the Civil War is happy. There is nothing. I, you know, if you want to find something, we're not going to argue about it during question time. I'm just going to go ahead and say that now. <laughs> you can write me later. Nothing about what he did during the Civil War was happy. Nothing about what he did to make it so that there was a, you know, all, all of this stuff, nothing was happy. But your response to it, how each and every one of you respond to the realities and complexities of that time can be beautiful. It doesn't have to be poetic. It doesn't have to be pretty, um, but it can be really, really beautiful because beauty is not always pretty. It's not always tied up with a nice bow and, and looks good. It's, it's honest. It's real. It's authentic. So your response to this, whether that's to change the name 50 years from now or 20 years from now or never, is beautiful. Because as you said, there, there is a, there is a there, if that's going to happen, you would want it to come from the groundswell up. Right. Uh, going into um, the work of the commission, the only thing that was a real concern of mine was that the narrative uh, be one that was nuanced and not one that tended to favor the lost cause in any way. And. Uh, I wonder if in your own um, understanding of Robert E. Lee, if you also have a nuanced vision of, of that past. Uh, I, I don't know whether I need to explain that any more than I have already or what your response to that would be. Unpack that just a little more so I make sure I'm Okay. 
With the nuanced vision, um, one of the things that had troubled me about the narrative, both of Robert E. Lee and the narrative of the university, is that the narrative that was popular on this campus, if it had been written into a history essay, we would have given an F because mm. it omitted things that they didn't want to deal with. And uh, the admission, the omission of things that were there, for instance, coincidentally to the establishment of the commission, uh, a local journalist who is a very independent spirit who is also a member of the class of 1973, published uh, President Robert E. Lee's 1866 testimony before the Joint Congressional Commission on Reconstruction. And even though my area of study was 19th century uh, U.S. history South, I had never seen that before. And uh, that was a real eye-opening account to read, but something that was hidden just in plain sight. And so in that uh, testimony, there was the advocacy for removing all blacks from the state of yeah. Virginia, but there's also the problem for uh, a lot of us with, well, do you throw the baby out with the bathwater? And so if you're looking at a nuanced vision, you have to look at, well, everybody who is human, who lives, does good things and they do bad things. And so do we all, do we have a, a nuanced narrative that accounts for the good things as well as the bad things? I, see what you're I think I have a nuanced version and vision of the personhood of Robert E. Lee. But I, there's a pretty damning vision of the caricature of Robert E. Lee that's been created since the 1920s especially, um, at least in North Carolina, that was when it really got kind of started for us. We kind of, maybe earlier in Virginia, as soon as he died, I've heard here they were ready to do things. But, um, you know, I, I think that um, what's happened with Robert E. Lee is, as I said at the MTV VMA, is we've made him an idol of white supremacy. And it's clear to me what you have to do with idols as a pastor. You can't have idols. But that doesn't negate the fact that there was a man named Robert E. Lee who, just like all of us, did some good things and did some bad things. So I think if we separate the person from the caricature, for instance, if we separate the fact that Robert E. Lee and you know, wrote letters about not putting up statues or whatever. Those were some things that I can actually be okay with versus the caricature of him in the chapel. That's a very different version of Lee. So it's all in how we read history. It's all in how we understand history. It's all in how we realize the personhood versus the idolatrous caricature. So. Okay. Um, so do you have recommendations for us um, as we move forward? I'm going to scoot over here. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> My hope and prayer for you is that you be honest with yourselves. And I'm not saying you're lying to yourselves now. I hope you bring people on, the faculty and the staff, as you were doing, that are people of integrity and of truth-telling. I tell this story in my book when I was being, when I was from the ages of one to four, my mom and dad hired a nurse to care for me. She was a black woman who was in her 60s or 70s. Um, so it was very much just seen out of the help, if you will. I don't think my parents meant anything bad by it, but that's just what we did in Statesville, even in the 90s. Janie would not drink out of the same glasses as me. She would not eat 
the leftovers of my food or even eat with me at the same table. When my parents would ask her why, she said, that's what I've always been taught. When I would ask her, why won't you eat with me? It was because she said we were different. And that kills me to this day because by God we are different, but I believe in a God who is all about bringing differences together. Bringing beautiful, different things that may be broken, but bring them together. I mean, that's, that's the whole point. That's why we're here, is to somehow find each other and love each other. I mean, that's the heart of, uh, of everything we do. That is the heart uh, of religion. That is the heart of why you study things. Is not so that you can get a good degree and get a good job. And I mean, those things are nice and great and good and do it and stay in school. But it's so you can find yourself and therefore love yourself and love others. That's the point. That's the hope. Uh, one thing that concerns me, uh, that has concerned me for about, well, 25 years, and you touch this a little bit in your book, is that I, as a faculty member who focused in graduate school was 19th century American South, I felt very uncomfortable and very unsafe uh, with asking uh, critical questions about Robert E. Lee. Uh, and for most of my career here, I did that. And I found that the events of 2017 made it safer to ask those questions. Uh, you seem to suggest in um, your memoir that 2017 also was sort of a pivotal point with regard to your thinking. Can you expand on that a little bit? <clears throat> In 2017, I was serving a church um, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, the church was about 20 to 25 members. Uh, they were nice people, I'm sure. Uh, they, uh, the, the first Sunday I was there, I was sitting in on a Sunday school class, and one of the uh, Sunday school uh, teachers said that he saw a white officer changing a black woman's tire and therefore racism was dead. Um, I hadn't detected that, but um, when Charlottesville happened, um, 15 days later I was on the stage of the VMAs and 10 days after that I'd lost my job. Because those same people who had said racism was dead were some of the most racist people I've ever met. Charlottesville changed everything. You know, you, you, you know, as there's some of us in the room that are old enough to remember when Kennedy was shot or when the Challenger exploded or when 9-11 happened, Cha uh, Charlottesville is one of those events. I remember where I was, I remember what I was doing, and I remember the heartbreak of realizing that Robert E. Lee was at the center of it. That that statue that those people were making into an idol was my uncle. And that, I, I was angry, I was really angry. Um, but I also know that we're changing things. Like it, it, it has been, not only, it was a horrific event, and, and Susan Bro, uh, uh, the mother of Heather Heyer, and I have actually gotten to be good friends, and I count that one of my greatest uh, friendships out of all of this. Um, but Charlottesville changed everything, and I think I know why, and, and you can disagree with me if you'd like, but I think it's actually because Racism suddenly affect a white girl. It was no longer just for people of color. 
it, it, that white supremacist killed a white girl. And suddenly, oh crap. It's time to talk about it. That's when it changes. Is when it starts to affect the white people in the room. When you start to squirm a little bit because that's making you uncomfortable. That is why Charlottesville changed for so many people. Well, let's talk about the idolatry a little bit because the one thing that you know is in the early part of the 20th century, the heroic sized statues like the one in Charlottesville begin to appear. And I think that the statues on Monument Avenue in Richmond are probably even bigger than that one in Charlottesville. I've never seen the one in Charlottesville, but I've seen the one in, once in Richmond. And a lot of those things went up. And not only did they go up, but as one uh, person involved in putting them up in the early part of the 20th century wrote, that they were writing history, R-I-G-H-T-I-N-G, rather than W-R-I-T-I-N-G. What do you do with those statues? And, uh, and there are a lot of scholars, uh, there are a lot of people in my profession who uh, object strenuously to removing them because the statues are themselves history. So with regard to this idolatry, how do you deal with these statues that are bigger than life? Robert E. Lee on Monument Avenue in Richmond is enormous. And even the idea of taking it away would be uh, a tremendous challenge for folks to do. So what do you do with the idolatry? I mean, it's easy to say take statues down, right? But like, you've actually got to think of, uh, of, of the reasoning behind why we would want to deal with that idolatry. For instance, in my hometown of Statesville, there's a, there's a Confederate memorial. People have to walk by that every time they go to vote or go to the courthouse or go to church. Is that, I mean, like, I, I'm not a law person, but is that fair or equal, you know, to, to, to me? And if you're going to get beyond the empathy, you've got to be educated by it. As you said, the writing of history... You don't have to go far from my hometown to get to Chapel Hill, where uh, Silent Sam has been causing some issues for some people there. Silent Sam got pulled down by people in North Carolina. We're a rambunctious bunch, um, especially those people in Chapel Hill. Um, but, you know, I don't, know, I don't think there's a blanket answer. I really don't. Because, you know, what do you do with Monument Avenue? What do you, you know, and we've tried, some people have tried to fix Monument Avenue by adding statues. Does that really add something there, or does it detract? And I, you know, I don't, I wish I had an answer, but I think I'm just going to say I hope that it's a situational thing, that we can figure it out together. Okay. Uh, one of the things that has certainly been suggested by historians if you place these statues in context. If there is some way that you provide contextual history and explain the period uh, when the monuments were going up and all of the backstory that goes with that. Um, what do you think about that? Uh, it's better than nothing. Um... I mean, like, I mean, I'm going to be honest. I would love to have them all down, but I just, I don't, I, I don't think that's going to happen as easily as I'd like it to. So context may help. Okay. It may help turn the tide at least until we get to the point where the groundswell that we were talking about earlier kind of creates some conversation. Uh, one thing that just uh, popped in my mind, and I, I was thinking about it with regard to taking stuff down. Have you read Mitch Landrieu's book, A White Southerner Confronts His Own History? Yeah. Uh, what do you think of that book? Uh, I like my book better. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just messing. No, I think it's a great book. Um, I think we, you know, I think the more perspective that we have in terms of, you know, um, I was just kidding. That sounded really bad. I, no, it's I, fine. It's fine. You guys are going to think. I, anyway, um, I did enjoy that book because I, and I think it's important for, for all of us with voices and with whatever way we can communicate to engage in that conversation. 
of what it means to confront a history, to confront a legacy. And that's not just with people who look and sound and talk like me. Um, uh, I heard your, your, uh, some of you are having conversations surrounding just mercy and stuff like that. I mean, that's important too. I mean, the more perspective we have, the better. I really think that's important. Uh, one of the uh, big problems I think that you would uh, acknowledge, and maybe we've already covered this, is that you and I are both Southerners, and uh, you and I uh, have that burden of Southern history, as uh, C. Van Woodward would call it. I think the problem that I see is that black, white, black and white Southerners who lived so close together, even in small towns, really have never known each other. Do you agree with that perspective, and how do we get to know each other? I, I don't know. I actually think in Statesville I've had the, the great privilege of, of having some wonderful, strong women of color in my life. But I don't think that was specifically, I, I actually think that was unique to me. So maybe, maybe I think you're right, actually. I'm a, yeah. Um, but I'll tell you this story. Uh, my mom is a nurse. She, is, uh, she has her doctorate in nursing, and she teaches and does all this great stuff. But back in the 80s, um, she was uh, on the floor, and a person of color came into the hospital and he was an LGBT, uh, a gay man, and he was, had been diagnosed with AIDS, and he was actively dying. And no one in that hospital, except for my mother, would give him a sponge bath. Because he was the first case in Iredell County, this was the 1980s, people had no idea about HIV AIDS, I mean, they, they didn't understand, and they were terrified. But my mom was willing to take a risk. As William Sloan Coffin would say, she risked something big for something good. Because even though that man died of AIDS, he died with some sense of dignity because someone was willing to care for him. And so what we're going to have to do in these small towns like Lexington, in these small towns like Statesville, is risk something big for something good. Now, that doesn't mean you come in with platitudes and sponge baths, but that does mean that you come in and invite each other to the barbecue. And you have those conversations, and you do what we're doing now and finding that common ground that even though we have found things that we may disagree with, or you all may disagree with, but you're here. You showed up. And showing up is half the battle. Uh, one thing that you have uh, said before, and you also mention it in your memoir, is experiences with strong women of color. What about with strong men of color? Well, I'm talking to one right now. <laughs> uh, I, I, I've had some really great men of color, but I, I'm one of those people. Um, I, I respond better with women and, 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 and their mentorship, and I've had that opportunity, but I'm grateful for those men, too, who have been there. So, okay. Yeah. I think we're going to open it up to Q&A. Well, first, thank you for this amazing conversation. I hate to cut you off, but uh, we've only got the room till 4, so I would like, if anyone has questions, just stand up and then I'll restate it. Yes. Hi, my name is uh, Mark Simmons. I'm a one out here at uh, Washington and Lee. Uh, I saw a documentary once. It's called The Sins of Our Father, and it's about the children of members of the Third Reich and having to come to grips with their name. Uh, and some of them had not, and some of them continued to defend the actions of their fathers. Do you think that, I, again, I don't know quite your whole journey, but as a, a person of faith, do you believe that you've received more peace by not having to constantly defend the actions, but rather accepting them and trying to create who you are separately 
and move to a better future? So the question was, uh, does he believe as a person of faith that by not having to defend the actions and being able to simply accept them and move forward, that's made it easier to reconcile your name? I actually think it's made it a little bit harder. Um, it would be really easy to wave that Confederate flag and say, go, uh, go Robert E. Lee, um, especially where I live um, in Statesville, because, I mean, there's Confederate flags everywhere. Um, there was one in my bedroom growing up. Um, I think what, what, what makes it worth it is knowing that there will be at least a small footnote in history that says that there was a Robert W. Lee who did something a little bit different. And I'm not doing it for glory or, you know, whatever. That's not, I don't, yeah, whatever. Um, I'm doing it because it's the right thing to do. And in the end, history will judge my actions. So, thank you. Anyone else? Go ahead. Hi. Um, you spoke about this in reference to the Charlottesville riots, but I just want to know, how do we step away from the idea that injustice is only wrong when it happens to a white person instead of it being wrong as a whole in reference to people of color who struggle and have been struggling in this um, America for, for, for a while? So our question was, how do, wait, what did you say? <laughs> say it again. Okay, how do we step away <laughs> How do we step away uh, from the idea that injustice is only wrong when it happens to a white person instead of when it happens to anyone? Uh, when I lost my job in August, September of 2017, um, I was devastated. But one of the things that my wife, who is the most amazing lady, uh, uh, pointed out to me was, Rob, you know what? You're going to find something else. But there are people who may not. And I think about that a lot. Like, we've got to kind of get out of this narrative that it's all about me and my, not clan, that's not a good one, um, my tribe. We've got to get out of our own echo chambers and say that this is not just about us, it's about everybody. And it's not an us-them mentality either. We've got to get away from that. It's a, it's a us together. And how do we have that togetherness as a collective without assimilating? Um, does that make you know because like you can't assimilate like I, I can't expect you to assimilate into my culture and then me be concerned about you because you assimilated that sounds like the Borg from Star Trek and that's not good at all um, you know I, you, you, got, you, you can't assimilate but you've also got to realize that this, this isn't us we're all in this together liberating to me in a way that yeah. it's hard to describe. But Still hard though, I'm sure. <laughs> but I wanted to ask Professor Delaney, um, I had the benefit of, I can't even remember, it's probably 12 to 15 years ago when you did your oral history project uh, of being interviewed. And that was a little bit liberating for me too as a child having talked about my childhood in Lexington, and I just, I think it's important that you conceived of that project and saw it through and just wanted you to describe that. Well, one of the projects was studying, uh, studying uh, school desegregation in this part of Virginia. And uh, actually this, the General Assembly's committee that was on the opposite, on the commemoration of the 50th celebration of the Brown decision asked me if Washington and Lee could do something and we actually had already done something with the forum and so I conceived this oral history project and it was really very very uh, interesting in the differences in white and black views in this part of Virginia that had very small black population 
were very, very different and very, very interesting. But one of the things I'd like to append to your question uh, that came up in already in uh, Rob's remarks with regard to uh, one of the questions from the audience is that one thing that people don't realize is that the latter part, or most people don't think about, is that the latter part of the civil rights movement, the part that's in the 1960s, coincides with the centennial of the Civil War. And it, in the news, it overshadows anything about the centennial of the Civil War. When I was growing up, in Lexington, Virginia, you almost never saw a Confederate flag. There are more Confederate flags in Lexington, Virginia right now than ever before. But when I was growing up in Lexington, Virginia, as in other parts of the South, those Confederate flags came out as a part of the commemoration of the centennial of the Civil War. And then they ended up staying because then people adopted them as a symbol of resistance to civil rights. So that is something that I'd like for you to also to remember when you think about some of these issues is why those flags are still there. And the fact that I came of age in the 1950s and finished high school in 1961. And in my experience before 1961, Confederate flags were virtually invisible in this town unless you went in Lee Chapel. And so the, the resurrection of Confederate flags, and especially in Lexington, in places they had never been before, is sort of astonishing. And they are also there. You have to question the reasons that they are there. And I think that to ask those questions is very, very important. And we are out of time. No, no. We, can, we have time for one more question. Do you want to? Yes, you can say your name. I'm Christina from the Bay Lake. I teach here at the Fed now. Um, we've heard this on the here and there throughout the talk, and Professor Delaney asked about recommendations to Fed now. But um, I'd be interested in hearing also uh, about how to reach those don't even come to your table. Because mm -hmm. you can't fight you, with your family and Thanksgiving, but you have been invited there. You can talk to people here, and some people may disagree with some things you <coughs> say or not. But in a sense, we're preaching to the choir. But how about those people who um, may be white or black, but there is also a very uh, So our question is, how do we reach those people who won't come to the table? Um, I, well, no, I, <laughs> I, I have, you know, this has been a fairly calm talk, believe it or not. I mean, there, I think, here's the deal. We each, I think all of us have a platform, right? Um, some people come to talks to hear this guy talk because I have a name that resonates. And then they hear, oh, wait, this is not what I thought. So sometimes it's bait and switch with me. Um, you know, if I can catch them and say I'm Robert Lee, they're like, oh, cool. And then, uh, then it's not. No, but in all seriousness, I think it comes down to what are you willing to do as a white person? Um, are you willing to go out to the highways, the byways, the hamlets, the small towns, the big cities, um, not just the South, but maybe Wisconsin, Michigan, California, and say, look, you may think this isn't a problem. You may think this doesn't exist here. But I have seen something. You know, and again, I'm a preacher, so I'm going to end on this. Um, some of the most profound and prolific lines in Scripture are after the resurrection. I have seen the Lord. Because what they saw was something different. They saw something they had not seen before. 
and they wanted to share it. So what you can do today is you have seen something here. And again, this is not about me. This is not about Robert Lee. This is not about Robert E. Lee. The most amazing thing is that two people who came from very different ways of life, very different upbringings, were able to sit down and say something that was actually kind of interesting. So you have seen something, and now it is incumbent upon you to go and tell others. And it doesn't matter if they don't want to listen. They're going to have to hear you. Keep shouting it. Be persistent. I think we get in this mindset of we can't say, we can only say it once. No, you can say it as many times until they start to listen. That is the beauty and the challenge of what we have to do. All right, thank y'all. <laughs>